Thank you. And thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak at this meeting. Um, I have, I've framed the title of the talk in a very controversial manner just to, just to really engage um, the debate and get some discussion going. Um, now, lactate is something we all measure routinely in intensive care. Uh, almost every blood gas machine has a lactate electrode built into it. And so with every blood gas that we do, we get a lactate measurement. And the question really is, do we understand lactate? And as people commonly believe, I think there are a number of myths about lactate measurement. And so we will just work through some of these questions. So, and the reason we keep measuring lactate is because we use lactate as an indicator of dysoxia, as an impaired oxygen utilization by the cell. So is it always the case? Now, we all know the traditional pathway for lactate and biochemistry, so it comes as part of glycolysis, where you have pyruvate being formed from glucose, and when you have excess pyruvate, or when you've got, where if pyruvate cannot be channeled into the citric acid cycle, then the metabolic fate for pyruvate is, is lactate, as, as, you can, as you can see here. Now, and the reaction which Con which sort of controls this whole stoichiometry between pyruvate and lactate can be written as you can see there. It's an NADH, NAD dependent reaction. And, and in normal health, we produce about 1,500 millimoles of lactate. The skin produces about 25% of that. The red cells produce a similar, similar amount. And the brain, muscle, and the GI mucosa produce small quantities of lactate. And we also utilize the same amount of lactate every day, about 1,500 millimoles. And the liver is the predominant metabolizer of lactate through gluconeogenesis, about 50% of that. And 25% is utilized by the kidneys and a small proportion by the heart, lung, and, uh, and to a certain extent by the brain. Now, the first false belief is that metabolism of pyruvate always produces lactic acid. In fact, that's, it's, it's not the case. Lactic acid is never produced to, to be released into the serum. What does actually happen is when you, when you have lactate, it's the lactate which leaves the cell, and the hydrogen stays inside the cell to prevent, to prevent significant extracellular acidosis. And it's in fact, it's lactic, lactic acid in itself has never been shown to be produced. The, the second myth that people always have is that an elevated lactate is always associated with anaerobic metabolism during shock states. Now, the, there's abundant evidence to show that during states of aerobic glycolysis, when you have excess glycolysis, rate of glycolysis, then you have excess pyruvate being produced, which overwhelms the capacity of the citric acid cycle, and which, therefore, the excess pyruvate, even in the absence of anaerobic metabolism, gets converted into lactate. And one of them is sepsis, which produces, you have, you have excess aerobic glycolysis. Certain drugs do this, especially catecholamines. I'll come to in a moment. A number of metabolic disorders do this. And certain cancers, when you have excess production, in, especially in leukemia, and lymphomas, then you have excess aerobic glycolysis. And so, the, and so when you look at what happens in shock states, that's what we are concerned with as clinicians. There are two mechanisms described. One is the catecholamine surge, and the second one is anaerobic metabolism. And in fact, it's the catecholamine surge which is the principal driver of lactate in critically ill patients. The, <clears throat> And the reason catecholamines put up lactate is when you have adrenaline, which when you have high levels of plasma adrenaline, they stimulate the, the cyclic AMP pathway, which, in, which then stimulates the sodium potassium pump, the cyclic AMP, and therefore when you have an increase in cyclic AMP, it starts to promote glycolysis, which then results in excess pyruvate, which overwhelms the capacity of the citric acid cycle, and therefore you get a lactate. And that's why in situations when you have excess catecholamines, like when you use salbutamol and so on, in people with asthmatics, you get a high lactate. Now, 
just to give you some idea of the, the concentrations that, of adrenaline that we see in health and in exercise and catecholamine infusions, in normal health, we function at very low levels of adrenaline at 50 picograms per mil. And when severe exercise, you can even go up to about 1,500 picograms and circulatory shock you go up to 4,000 to 5,000 picograms. So, it's, so adrenaline is concentrations are significantly raised in shock states and, and therefore contributes to lactate. And the evidence for this it was shown in a beautiful study back in the late 70s. If you in fact sub subject in an animal model of hemorrhage where you, you beta block the animal and then you subject the animal to hemorrhage. In fact, you blunt the lactate rise as shown, um, as shown here. And, and this is also shown in, in septic shock where you, you block the ATP um, enzyme activation through the use of warbane in those animals where they, where, in, in, sorry, it's not just a hu human study, where they, they, they used warbane, the lactate rises were blunted as compared to the groups where it wasn't, wasn't used. So again, showing that it's adrenaline, which is the principal driver of lactate in critically ill patients with shock, it's not total anaerobic metabolism. So, because lactate is frequently used as an endpoint in resuscitation, people have suggested that lactate clearance or lactate concentrations can be used as, a, as an endpoint, and therefore we often titrate fluids. When you see a raised lactate, we say perhaps we should give more fluids or more catecholamines to drive it. And again, um, Two randomized controlled trials have looked at it in detail. One was, the, this was published in the Blue Journal, the, the Jensen study, um, and where they compared two, two groups, the, um, uh, where the conventional treatment arm, where they use blood pressure and CVP and fluid, fluid status, and the second arm, where they use the conventional measures plus a 20% reduction in lactate every two hours, and they gave more fluids. And, in the intention to treat analysis, they in fact found no difference in mortality between the two groups. And importantly, between the two groups, when they're even accounting for fluids and all those therapies, additional therapies given for lactate clearance, the lactate concentrations were similar at the end of the resuscitation period between the two groups. So, so really there was no evidence in that particular study. And there was then a subsequent study by Jones et al., which, uh, which appeared in the JAMA in the same year, again, comparing lactate guarded therapy versus central venous saturation, again, showing no difference between the two groups. And there was then this, um, uh, the, um, the, a, a meta-analysis with trial sequential analysis using four trials. Um, and the, the point estimate is obviously in favor of lactate in this, but in fact, the, the one trial which, which, was, which showed the clear evidence of lactate benefit was a 25-patient study. So, so in reality, lactate guidance as an endpoint, lactate is useful for you to be aware that it's a marker of stress, but you don't really use it to drive your therapy to try and get your lactate back to normal. The, and because lactate is a strong anion and causes an acidosis, there's, there's this belief that hyperlactatemia is always associated with a raised anion gap, and therefore, if you have a normal anion gap, people believe that you can't have a normal lactate. Uh, you can't have a raised lactate. And so that's another myth that, has to be, that needs to be dispelled. And the reason why the anion gap may not show a raised lactate is A, the lactate elevations are not significant, or if you start with a metabolic alkalosis to begin with at the time when you develop your shock state, then in fact your anion gap may not be elevated, or sometimes if the patient is hypoalbuminemic, the al low albumin can mask a raised anion gap. And if people, if I'm just going to show you an example of how, and the anion gap is, the albumin is critical because our, critically, because our patients in intensive care are frequently hypoalbuminemic. And I just want to show you this example here, where I'm not sure if you can see from the back there. So this is the chronology of a laboratory report in a patient from right to left. And you can see here, when the patient is profoundly acidotic, the anion gap was only 11. And as the patient improved, and as you can see, the, um, when, the, when the bicarb went up to 19 and the patient actually improved, the anion gap paradoxically rose to 20. And the reason why that happened was because the albumin was very low to start with, was about 15, and actually went up to 27. So 
thus unmasking the true anion gap. So hypoalbuminemia is, a freak, is one of the common reasons why you don't see a raised anion gap. The, the other situation where lactate becomes, um, um, the role of lactate becomes debatable is in the setting of gut ischemia. Now, surgeons will argue if you suspect someone with gut ischemia and they'll say, oh, show me the lactate. Is the lactate high? Well, if the lactate is normal, then you can't have gut ischemia. Again, there's, there, that's, that's not the case. There are a number of studies which have, which have looked at this and have shown lactate to be, uh, have a very low sensitivity and specificity as a marker of gut ischemia. And the reason why that happens is, A, it depends on the extent of your ischemic segment. B, if you've got total obstruction, then obviously the lactate is not cleared by the gut. The, there's portal venous circulation which dilutes the lactate, and, and the liver and the muscle also act as very efficient lactate sinks, and therefore it can, they can mask the rise in lactate despite a fairly severe ischemic segment of the gut. Now, the other common myth is that that the Hartman solution that we use, especially given the earlier talk that we had about um, the, um, hyperchloremic acidosis, that the Hartman solution is beneficial for correction of acidosis because the lactate gets converted to bicarbonate. Now, that's th that there's no metabolic pathway in the body where the lactate gets converted to pyruvate, uh, to bicarbonate. Lactate only goes back to pyruvate. And the, and the, reason, um, and the reason that this happens, why the lactate, when you give Hartman solution, why the bicarbonate increases is because the, when, you, when the lactate is administered to the patient, the lactate gets metabolized and there's a change in the strong ion difference of the body. And the reason that happens is if you look at the physicochemical approach where the water is the predominant source of hydrogen in the body and it's the dissociation of water which, which controls the amount of hydrogen in the body. And, and this dissociation of water is controlled by three components, the carbon dioxide tension, the strong ion difference in the body, and the weak acid concentrations, which is the atote. Now, um, the strong cations in the body are the sodium and potassium, and the strong anions are chloride, lactate, and ketones, and the normal strong ion difference is about 40 to, 40 to 45 milliequivalents per liter. Now, whenever your strong ion difference decreases, you get a metabolic acidosis. When your strong ion difference increases, you get a metabolic alkalosis. And what happens when you, when you give someone a solution with a strong ion difference of zero, like what happens with normal saline, then you will decrease the strong ion difference of plasma, and therefore you'll get a metabolic acidosis. So it doesn't happen just with normal saline. It'll happen with 5% dextrose, because it's got a strong ion difference of zero. It'll happen with mannitol. It'll happen with half normal saline. It'll happen with four and a fifth. So any combination you take where the strong ion difference is zero will produce a metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, with Hartman's, it's got a strong ion difference of zero in the bag, but in vivo, when the lactate gets metabolized, it becomes a strong ion difference of 27, and therefore, it doesn't affect the strong ion difference of plasma as much as it does to saline, and that's why you have a, a, a restoration of plasma bicarbonate. So the net effect on base excess is, in fact, very neutral with Hartman's. The, the next one, the next sort of false belief that I want to talk about is that the lactate measurements in blood gas machines are always reliable. Now, it's, that's probably true about 95 to 98% of the time. Um, the lactate in blood gas machines is measured by the lactate dehydrogenase membrane system. The lactate in the laboratory is measured by the lactate oxidase method. Now what happens, and most of the time, these two are concordant. But there's one exception, and that's when you have ethylene glycol intoxication, then the glycolic acid interferes with the lactate dehydrogenase method, and therefore causes an error in the estimation of lactate. And in fact, overestimates the lactate by about 30 or four, almost about 30 or 40 millimoles per liter. And the true value becomes apparent when you send the same sample to to the laboratory and when you have, when you get the true measurement of lactate. So the difference between what you get in the blood gas machine and what you get in the laboratory is called the lactate gap 
And that's in fact used as a test for diagnosing ethylene glycol intoxication. So, so it's one of the very, very rare examples when the, when the blood gas machine is not accurate for the measurement of lactate. Now, and then of course, the lactate, the next component is does the measurement of lactate in the arterial blood, is it indicative of the total lactate profile in the arterial blood? And again, it's not the case because the, art, the blood gas machine measures L lactate whilst, and there's a very, very small component of D lactate in the blood, which is a tiny, tiny um, fraction. And the, 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 and the D lactate is, formally, is normally found in the small bowel. And therefore, whenever you have a bowel pathology, you can get a D lactic acidosis, which will not be measured by the blood gas machine. And the D lactic acidosis is, in fact, thought to be one of the contributors to the ICU encephalopathy syndrome. So uh, it's another, another caveat when, you, when it comes to measuring lactate. And again, along these lines, along the lines of the argument that I put forward before, is this next one here, because we traditionally use the Cohen and Woods classification, the type A and the type B lactic acidosis, type A associated with tissue hypoxia, and type B where they have no tissue hypoxia. Again, that distinction is very artificial. It, the, the Cohen and Woods provides a useful framework for understanding the mechanisms of lactic acidosis, but very rarely do these um, conditions, um, they are so discrete, they often coexist, and therefore I don't think that that classification is universally applicable. And, and finally, um, there is this myth that the lactic acid is, is a foe. Well, it, in general terms, a raised lactate is not useful. I wouldn't want my lactate to be high, but the lactate, lactate in the body, if it is raised, is it certainly is, is a fuel for the skeletal muscle during exercise, and it's also used by the brain. So, so the lactate as a molecule in itself is not dangerous, but the mechanisms which produce a raised lactate are the ones that you've got to be careful about. So, so really, in summary, I think the thing to keep in mind is that a raised lactate is a marker of physiological stress. It's a marker of a raised catecholamine state. Essentially, that's what it is. It's not always a sign of dysoxia, as in where the tissues cannot utilize the oxygen. It's not always a sign of that. And we have summarized these arguments um, in a recent review, um, what we call 10 contentious assertions about acid-base balance. So it's all there for people to look up. Thank you.